just check this work. Oh, it is working. All right, I guess you can stand close. All right, yo, so hi, my name is Blake Edwards, um, and I pursued an independent study this year. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the information and things that I researched during my independent study. Um, so during my independent study, I focused on artificial intelligence, which is a really hot topic right now. Um, and specifically within artificial intelligence, I focused on neural networks. Um, so what did I do in my independent study? Um, with my independent study, I had a lot of freedom. So at first I was a little bit lost, didn't know what to do. Um, but I ended up doing a lot of research on my own and, and kind of orienting myself and figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up um, looking at some research papers from MIT, um, Cornell, and University of South Carolina, where I'm going to be attending um, next fall. And I got a lot of useful information of where I wanted to start with this whole independent study. Um, and I did a lot of playing and toying around with some of the stuff that I learned. Um, and I really think that's the best way to learn anything. You learn enough to be dangerous to make some simple projects and do some, some cool things that you want to do. Um, and then another thing that I want to talk about real quick is artificial intelligence and machine learning. They're almost synonymous. Artificial intelligence is the general idea of computers performing artificially intelligent functions um, that a human could do. And machine learning is the way in which computers learn how to perform those artificially intelligent functions. So I have this graphic here, um, types of machine learning algorithms. Um, and this is just a small graphic that I found. Um, but it's basically just to show you how, how large this field is. This field is really big and it's really exciting for us, people that are going to be studying computer science. Um, and especially me, because I really want to pursue artificial intelligence. Um, so as you can see here, it's a little bit blurry because it's blowing up a little bit. Um, but the field's really big, and each of each part of these, each subset of each part of this graphic has its own open field of research. So there's just a lot going on, and a lot for all of us to learn, and things that we don't even know about yet that is going to be really cool in the future. So generally, what is a neural network? So you can start off thinking of a neural network as a type of black box that takes a set of inputs, such as the inputs of a, the sensors of a self-driving car. So that may be the radar on the self-driving car, maybe some sensors on the sides, maybe um, sensors telling you how far the car is in front of you, GPS data, um, and stuff of that nature. And essentially what comes out on the other end of this black box um, is controls for that car. What does it want to do? Does it want to drive? Does it want to brake? Does it want to turn right? Does it want to deploy the airbag? Um, so that's a general explanation. So now we're going to reveal that curtain and see a little bit of what's going on. So you can think of that black box as a universal function approximator. So as you can see, the arrow is on the left side. Those are, those are the inputs. This input comes in, um, and they eventually come to an output. And what the neural network does is it approximates the function needed to create those outputs that you need. So that it'll take that set of inputs, it'll approximate what operation needs to be done in order to decide what to do, turn left, turn right, break, um, et cetera. So within a neural network, there's neurons. And each of these neurons are organized into layers. Um, and here, this is a neural network, a really simple neural network of four layers. And then, one, two, one. Yeah, so in between each of these layers, the, the neurons and the layers, there's these weighted connections. And what these weighted connections do is it tells you the importance of the input from the, from the previous layer, how important it is to the next layer. Um, so as you can see, this is a fully connected neural network, a dense neural network, where each of the, each, each of the neurons um, is connected to every neuron on the next layer. Um, this is just a simple um, neural network. There's tons of varieties of each of these neural networks from that graphic that you saw earlier. Um, now we're going to zoom in on the top left corner of that neural network. So this is the first two neurons. I'm, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the math of what's going on just to show you guys what, what's generally going on. Um, so this is the top left corner of that um, network that I showed you. Um, and here are the first two neurons in that first layer and the second neuron in the second layer. And if we zoom in, those Ws represent those weighted connections um, between those neurons. And here are some arbitrary numbers that I just put in there um, to represent those weights. So that, um, I'll show you now, the weight, so this 53, um, 0.53, this may be the distance a car is in front of you. I'm just going to give that example. So 0.53, why is it 0.53? So 53 feet, say the car is in front of you. Um, but the neural network needs to understand what's going on from layer to layer. So it has to speak in a common language of numbers. So what you do is you squash those numbers down to a range of 1 um, and negative 1 in order for each of the layers to understand what's going on from layer to layer as you um, apply some mathematical operations. 
Um, so what happens is this input is multiplied by the importance value, the weight value, from the, from the connection from the neuron in the first layer to the second layer, um, and it determines um, this value, the product of that multiplication. And here I did the multiplication for the um, other neuron to the next neuron as well. Um, and these neurons are forward propagated. They're pushed through the network to the next node. The next neuron, neuro, uh, node is synonymous with neuron. Um, and then a bias is added. This is a whole field of research on its own, but basically the bias allows the universal function approximator to better fit um, the function that you're trying to approximate. So now what happens? So this number is 1.58, so it's kind of a nice number. It's not too big, um, not too small. But what we do um, when it gets to the next layer, say this number was 2,000, we can't have that because we need it to be speaking the common language of one and negative one. So we apply this activation function and it squashes it down um, back in between that range. And that essentially lets, it, that produces 0.83. That's another arbitrary number um, that you guys don't need to necessarily hold on to, but um, that's just to show you that it's in that one to negative one range. So now that blue dot represents that 0.83, and what happens is that's that top left corner, those little bit darker connections, and this, this um, output from the first layer to the next layer is now the input from that second layer to the third layer. So that, uh, those three blue dots just show you that um, input being propagated forward. Um, and now I have a little bit of a graphic. Um, that whole process is called forward propagation. So this is just a little simple GIF of those inputs going in, the importance values um, being calculated all at once to the next layers, um, and then producing some outputs. So that's a little simple graphic. So how does it correct itself? This is the fun part. This is what took us so long. Um, Nathaniel and I, we worked on this for weeks trying to figure this out. Um, because there's a lot of like differential calculus that we don't even know yet, but we kind of kind of figured it out. Um, <laughs> so what the network does is it makes predictions. So in this example, um, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0, 0. These are just arbitrary output values. Um, but I assign then drive brake turn. So in this uh, example, 90% drive. That's going to tell the car 90%. You should be driving right now. You shouldn't be braking. 90% 90% sure you should be driving right now. Um, <laughs> And there's 10% chance you should be breaking. So once it passes the threshold of 50%, it'll perform that action. That's not that important right now, but 90%, this car is driving. Um, so what it does is it makes this prediction, and obviously when you first create this neural network, this prediction is gonna be terrible. It's gonna tell you to break when you should be turning right. Um, so what you do, and now there's this fancy math equation. Don't worry about that, I'll simplify it in a second. Um, it, uses, <laughs> it uses the squared error cost function to determine the error. Um, and essentially, more simply stated, what's happening is it takes the average of the answers of what the car should be doing, minus the predictions of what the neural network thinks it should be doing, squares it, and takes the average of that. Doesn't really matter. Don't need to know that, really. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what it does with this cost function, this fun function up there, is it determines the cost, the error of the output with respect to each layer. So each layer obviously has some influence on what's going on in the next layers. So you determine the cost, how costly the error is, what's going on, um, is going wrong, and you back propagate um, how much that layer contributed to the error on the other end, um, and adjust the weights. I'll show you a little graphic right here. Oh, that's complicated. So <laughs> we have, yeah, so this, this um, GIF is a animation of backwards of the forward propagation. So as you go back through, as you determine the cost from layer to layer, you're going to adjust those weights just a little bit in order to produce a little bit more accurate of an outcome. Um, and that's important because that plays into the universal approximation. You don't want to correct the network so much that it um, exactly makes it um, the output that you want it, because then it'll be too fit. It might not. It might turn right when it really should be turning left. It gets a little bit, that, that's a whole other mathematical field in itself. But you, you want to just adjust the weights a little bit so that it's getting a little bit more accurate. And as you give it more and more examples, um, it'll get more accurate and you'll have a driving car that won't crash, hopefully. Um, so this is a little bit more complex. So this is the topography of a cost function. So that cost function that, you sh that I showed you before, between all, those, between all these neurons, all these layers, produces some type of topography, some type of graph. So this one on the top right is a simple example that I'll use. This yellow, the little yellow balls that are up there, those can be represented as the starting point of where the neural network is. Um, so obviously, the higher up on the graph that it is, um, 
the more costly, the more things that are going wrong with that neural network. And what you want to do is minimize that cost, minimize what's going wrong with that neural network. Um, so it uses gradient descent, it uses that cost function to perform gradient descent, which is just a fancy math term for minimizing error. Um, and that ball will essentially roll down that graph to minimize error. Um, so this is just a graph of the, the top, the one on the top right and actually the top left are four dimensional topographies, but um, so that was three dimensions, but the color represents the fourth dimension. Um, but the thing is with more complicated neural networks, you can't visualize them. So it gets to a point where it's n-dimensional. So I perform, I'll show you a little bit later one of the things that I worked on. It's 13,000 dimensions. You can't visualize that. It's, that's why we have computers do it. That's why um, computers are so useful, because um, humans can't think in that many dimensions. Um, so the first thing I did was simple linear regression. It's line of best fit. You can do it on your TI-83 calculator if you know how to plug in the right buttons. Um, and it essentially uses that same kind of squared error um, idea. And the uses of that is you can extrapolate data. Say you have um, a house, you have the square footage of a house, and you have the age of the house, and you want to determine the price of the house in the market. Um, linear regression can help you do that. It can also, um, by determining the correlation between them, um, and extrapolating, if you have both of those things, the square footage and the age, you can generally guess where the price of the house will be. Um, so the one on the top um, right is one that I did, and it's, hand, it's the linear regression that I performed with um, Python, a programming language. Um, and I drew in some of the lines just to show you um, what's going on. So that red line is my approximation. What's, what's the relationship between all those blue data points um, and those lines connecting to the red line are the error between um, between my red line and those points. And essentially, it's minimizing that error like it did before in the neural network. Um, so programmatically, it's, it's fairly simple. It's like 50 lines of code. You could do it probably in 25, but mine was like 50. <laughs> it wasn't very clean. Um, so my first neural network was a convolutional neural network, a lot more complicated. But I used a library by Google that Google, that Google uh, created, um, which allowed me to do it really simply. It's a special type of neural network that allows you to take images um, and basically determine what's in that image. So here's an example of a bird. It determines the features of the bird. It learns the features of a bird. And it'll predict that that bird is in that image, which is pretty cool. Um, so my convolutional neural network. For those of you who have taken a simple programming class, Hello World is the first program that you write. Um, it's basically to show that you can produce something and an output. Hello World. Like I wrote my first program. This project that I did was the Hello World of Neural Network. So it was simple for someone who's studying artificial intelligence, but for me who is alone and doesn't have a lot of guidance, like a lot of guidance in terms of resources, um, this is what I did and I was happy that I did it. So basically what my personal network did is it classified handwritten digits. So here's an eight written in uh, pixels and there's some uh, values associated with those pixels um, and it determined what digit was in there um, using convolutional neural networks. So here's Keras and TensorFlow, which are just some tools that I used to do it, made by Google, which made it really helpful. My large project, um, so what was my large project? I wanted to build a neural network constructor from scratch. So I wanted to not use that TensorFlow library. That's another arbitrary name. I don't really need to know. Um, but I didn't really want to use the Google tools. I wanted to learn what's going on, what's going on between each of these layers, what's happening. So what does that even mean? I wanted to, I wanted to um, so what is, a, what is a neural network constructor? So basically a neural network constructor, um, what I build is something where you can specify the number of layers that you want in your neural network, specify the number of neurons you want, um, and make a neural network on your own, which is kind of cool. You can import data into it and then perform the learning functions um, with the network and make your own neural network. So um, Nathaniel and I ended up pulling that off with a really simple um, network. I don't have a picture up here of that, but that's what we ended up doing. Um, and why does it matter? I want to learn the foundation of it you can use all those, all those tools that make it pretty simple, but I really wanted to learn the foundation of what's going on, so I decided to take on the big task of doing that, which ended up being pretty rewarding, because now we understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. <laughs> Here's some of the algorithms that we were developing. This is just four pictures. We have like 30 um, in a Google Drive that we like share with each other. Um, but yeah, some of the math that's going on, a lot of it's not really important, but um, we ended up using a lot of the whiteboard. A lot of the whiteboard spaces found a lot of doodles happening from classes going through. Um, so that was fun. 
Um, that's just an algorithm develop that's going on. Other projects that I've kind of worked on while I was in my independent study that probably wasn't allowed to do, but I did anyway. Um, <laughs> so I researched a little bit about cryptocurrency trading. Um, so a lot of you probably know about Bitcoin. Um, it's a really overhyped um, cryptocurrency. Um, but there's up here, there's a bunch of other cryptocurrencies that were going on. So when cryptocurrencies first got popular, um, I had the idea that wasn't unique of arbitrage. Arbitrage is taking advantage of differences in prices between markets of um, these different coins being traded. But then I ended up waiting too long and now it's, all the markets are saturated and I can't do that now. Um, and I looked at high frequency trading, which I've been interested in for a long time. That's what's happening on Wall Street, computers trading stocks. That's pretty cool. Um, and then I'm going to develop an entertainment um, social media service, hopefully, with Nathaniel over here. Um, we just found out the other day Facebook made the same exact app, so that's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, we waited too long. Um, but yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, how can kids continue my research? So I'm going to post the, the code on GitHub. It's going to be open to the world because uh, GitHub is just open to the world and provide documentation on what's going on so kids that take AP programming can look at the code and figure out what's going on and do some stuff um, for themselves. Um, I'd like to hopefully introduce what we're doing to some of the AP programming kids um, and show them what's going on. And I also want to stress that we are an exception um, because we all took AP programming and the only reason we were probably able to do these projects is because we took that class, because of Abby Goth here being a great teacher, um, and because of um, administration allowing us to do this. Um, we're not an exception. Any other kid could do this and do this independent study and learn what we learned. Um, so we really wanted to stress that, that we are an exception and that um, we, have, we have a lot of other kids that have potential to do even bigger and greater things. Um, so yeah, all the students who take our AP programming course have the ability to do this. Yeah, so that's the end of my part of the presentation. Um, I believe I'm going to have Nathaniel come up here. Thank you.